This afternoon, I want us to build upon the events that have happened since the last prophecy day. So that's 12 months, and I'm going to be using the current uh, cover of the new milestones to divide our talks into two parts. There's an awful lot that we could look at, but I just want to concentrate on the Brexit turmoil and Israel's friends and Britain's role uh, after Brexit. And these are two very interesting subjects, uh, and I want to tease out a lot of matters concerning these two things. When we look at prophecy, we have to remember that not everything goes smoothly. It's like the tide. It comes in, it flows in, but it goes out again. Two steps forward and one step back, two steps forward and one step back, but slowly by step by step, it achieves its end of high time. Now some prophecies come to pass very rapidly, but the majority it takes a long, long time for the change to come, but eventually it does come. And there are setbacks, and this is a test of our faith, that when things that we thought would happen don't happen, we can question whether we understand the scriptures are right. But nine times out of ten, it's our misunderstanding of the timings. I know when I was younger, when Britain came out of the Middle East and we thought, well, Britain's got a role in the Middle East. How can she possibly go back in? And yet here we are, 40, 50, 60 years on, and we see Britain beginning to go back into that role that God has ordained that she should play a role in the Middle East and a friend of Israel. So there's lots of things which are becoming clearer. The closer we come to the events, then matters like Israel's relations with the Arab nations around her, which is something Brother Thomas talked about 170 years ago, we can see in the past four or five years a tremendous shift in the relationship which Israel has culminating in an incredible meeting last week that we should look at. So the picture is so much clearer that that the God prophesied through the prophets so long ago is coming to pass. We have seen Russia's militarization. We know that there is to be a Gogin power of Ezekiel 38 and we can see the preparations that Russia is making to be that guard over the nations, to provide them with their weaponry and their, his superior powers to shield them and to bring them together under his rulership. That's much, much clearer than it was when, you know, 20 years ago the Soviet Union disintegrated and it all seemed to turn to dust. But times have moved on. It's God's timetable that we have to go by, not man's timetable. And we can see the United States of Europe, with Britain on the way out, Europe is bending every effort to achieve its goal of a United States of Europe, a political union. And again, that picture has become much clearer in the past two years. And we think of the rift between the West and Europe, between America and uh, Russia and Europe, and um, we see how that is intensifying uh, under the present president of America, Donald Trump. And again, that's something we've been waiting for because the scriptures made it clear that there will be two parties, as we're going to see. That one that is opposed to the invasion of Israel and other party that is behind the invasion of Israel. And Britain and America and the allies, the Commonwealth allies, are to be on the side of Israel. And again, we can see a much clearer picture just in the past few years. And we can see now a role for Britain in the future, not bound by Europe, but her eyes set upon the world as a worldwide trading power. So these are some of the things that we're going to be looking at. Uh, not all of them, we're mainly the, uh, the two on this side. The brother Roberts, back in 1874, looking at the signs of the times of his day, had this comment to say, the watchers watch for it and wait. The tokens multiply. That was nearly 150 years ago. 
how much more the tokens have multiplied. We're very privileged, brothers and sisters, to be living in this generation that will see the coming of the Lord Jesus and the fulfillment of all these many prophecies which speak of the times of the end. So, Brexit. Everyone's been asking, you know, where is it going? And we have to turn to scriptures to see the answer of why we are in the mess that we are in. With the politicians being confounded and great bitterness and divide between the two sides. The scriptures guide us that this would be the case. Britain has a role outside Europe. She has to be forced out of the grip of Europe. And because we are in the end times, there are many prophecies that speak of these times. Two notable ones are Daniel chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 16, which we've looked at. Daniel 2 shows to us that in the latter days, because this is what was revealed to Nebuchadnezzar, what shall be in the latter days, that that image would stand upon its two feet of iron and clay, stand upon its feet in order to come against Israel, to be destroyed by the little stone power. And we can see the development of the United States of Europe and Russia, the two legs, the dragon and the beast of Revelation 16. We can see that development taking shape before our eyes. We're seeing the feet being formed. The image is getting ready to stand, to be drawn against God's people in order that God's judgments might be poured out. And Revelation 16, we have been looking at those frog-like spirits which are drawing the nations to come against God's people. And it is in the midst of that framework that God has a role for Britain. A role to be on the side of Israel, not against his people. Therefore she can't be part of Europe, who is part of the groupage uh, that come against Israel. So there has to be a separation, and that's what we're seeing. Now I chose Psalm 33 as our short reading because it expresses so aptly what is happening today. Yahweh bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught, or Yahweh frustrates the counsels of the nations. He maketh the devices of the people of none effect, or he makes the plans of the people of none effect. The counsel of Yahweh standeth forever, and the thoughts of his heart to all generations. So whatever Mrs. May wants to do, whatever Juncta and all the rest want to do, it will be God's plan and his purpose that will be the thing that happens. Nobody can frustrate the purpose of God. They stand forever. He has planned right from the beginning and he has portrayed what he's going to do through the prophets so that we can know those things. And in the previous two verses, we read this, didn't we? Let all the earth fear Yahweh. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. That's the language of creation, but the psalmist here is using it of God's dealings with the nations. As we've seen earlier, that God's plan and purpose is to reveal his glory to the nations, to judge them for their wickedness and their violence against his people and they're putting him to one side. They're going to face God's wrath. There is an appointed day and in that day it will happen. And the nations will then fear you. They will stand in awe of his almighty power and the things that he has said will stand. And so we have this picture of a coming invasion. Whether it's Putin or a successor matters not, but the cartoonist has drawn it with Putin there. Coming down into Turkey, into Israel, down into Egypt, in fulfilment of what scripture has said. But Ezekiel 38 tells us that there is a group of nations who are in opposition. And it's that group of nations that we're interested in. And it has been our historical understanding that Britain and the Commonwealth, Young Lions, America and Australia and India and these other Commonwealth nations are part of this invading forces. They're standing on Israel's side. 
along with Arab nations who at this time are standing for Israel. A truly remarkable state of affairs which a few years ago would seem an impossibility but you have to be patient, God's plan works out and because of the common enemy that they have in Iran it's drawn Israel and the Arab nations together and Britain finds herself on the part of Israel and the Arab nations rather than with you and so what we've been witnessing are the struggles that the angels are having behind the scenes to make sure that Britain is drawn out of the clutches of Europe out of Catholic Europe who wants to enslave her after their ways he wants Britain to re-engage with her past Protestant spirit that spirit of adventure, of exploration, of uh, trading with many nations and God has set about the circumstances which has caused this to happen now we're not going to look at the reasons why we understand that Britain is the latter-day merchant power it's dealt with in milestones and Bible magazines and many other articles but, so we're not going to deal with that aspect now but I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 23 because in Isaiah 23 we have an incredible chapter which is all about Tyre and we believe that Britain is the latter-day Tyre power so in Isaiah chapter 23 there's a chapter about the downfall of Tyre and it's coming to an end and the prophet Isaiah is caused to project forward to some future days so we just pick up I'll put the verses on there verses 5 and 7 as at the report concerning Egypt so shall be sorely pained at the report of Tyre pass she over to Tarshish howl ye inhabitants of the isle Tyre is this your joyous city whose antiquity is of ancient days her own feet shall carry her afar off to sojourn and that came to pass we know that Nebuchadnezzar drove the Tyrian power off the mainland onto the island offshore there was Alexander the Great and his great conquest that he built a causeway out to that island and broke the power of Tyre and since then that Tyrian power has moved it has gone afar off to sojourn and if we just map the movement it was Alexander the Great having conquered Tyre then moved down into Egypt and built Alexandria and that became the uh, naval capital in fact we read about ships of Alexander don't we in the New Testament and that waned and it moved to Venice and from Venice it moved to Genoa and then from Genoa to Lisbon and then from Lisbon to Amsterdam and then from Amsterdam to London and the dates I've put down there are just very rough dates because there was a lot of overlap as powers declined and other powers grew but scripture talks about her feet shall carry her afar off to Sodom and we've seen her moving further and further westward until the Tyrian power, the naval power, the merchant power has ended on Britain's shores and verse 15 tells us that uh, it shall come to pass in that day that Tyre shall be forgotten 70 years according to the days of one king after the end of 70 years shall Tyre sing as an harlot take and half go about the city thou harlot that hast been forgotten make sweet melody sing many songs that thou mayest be remembered so when was that day in that day well it's a phrase that occurs in scripture and very often um, we had it in brother um, Nicholas referred to Micah chapter 4 verse 6 and we have that same phrase in that day we shall see it's talking about the latter days and in the latter days this new Tyrian power which has now moved from its old original place is to react the uh, work of an harlot now the most famous Phoenician harlot was Jezebel 
And Jezebel came to a sticky end, didn't he, at the hands of Jehu. Throw her down from the window and trod her underfoot. And Jehu inherited the wealth of that uh, harlot, Jezebel. Uh, and what does Jehu mean? Yah is he. And we're looking forward, brothers and sisters, to the day when there will be a uh, greater than uh, Jehu, Yah is he, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and the wealth of this uh, Tyrian harlot has gathered together will go to him. Because we read at uh, the uh, end of the chapter that her merchandise and her hire shall be holiness to Yahweh. It shall not be treasured nor laid up, for her merchandise shall be for them that dwell before Yahweh, to eat sufficiently and for durable clothing. <coughs> so we understand that in the purpose of God, God is making Britain great again to be a trading power, to commit fornication with all the kingdoms of the world upon the earth, in order that that wealth might be used to bring God's people back to their land and to provide for them. This is the glorious destiny for the nation of Britain to be a friend of the Lord Jesus Christ, Israel's new king when he has broken the power of Gog and has established the kingdom of God in the land of Israel. Britain will be there to help him in that great work of gathering the Jews back to the land. And Isaiah sees these things, but it gives us an indication. He says that at the end of the reading, the beginning bit, at the end of 70 years, that Yahweh shall visit Tyre and she shall turn to her home. So it's indicating there is a 70 year period when the Tyrian power is broken and has no power. At the end of that 70 year period, then she revives and plays her role. So where do we start dating the 70 years? Well, Britain was very broken. At the end of World War II, which came to an end in September 1945, Britain was a broken power. She had expended all her energy in bringing about the um, overthrow of the Nazi power. And she felt from there onwards that she wasn't strong enough to stand on her own feet. And she joined the European Economic uh, Community, the EU of today. But she found it wasn't to her taste. It's taken a long time for her to realise that her heart doesn't lie in what the EU stands for. And interestingly, just 70 years from the ending of World War II, we had the referendum, and 70 years and nine months later, that Britain, as a country, decides that she no longer wants to be part of the EU and wants to break away and go her own way. And so the negotiations began to clear the way to, uh, for Britain to leave the EU. And that's not been easy. The EU has its own powers of persuasion and remembering that Mrs May was one who voted to remain. She has her heart in Europe. And that's why we've had two years of uh, talks which have got really nowhere. And here we are, almost at the end of the two-year period, uh, and so things are in a mess. The angels have had to work so hard. So many of her ministers and her negotiators have re resigned because they don't agree with the package that she has negotiated with the EU, which traps EU into the clutches uh, of the uh, traps Britain into the clutches of the EU may be forever. And so here we are. If we think of a clock and Article 50, which triggered the two year countdown to Brexit on the 29th of March 17, and this is Brexit Day next month, 29th of the 19th, we're at two and a half minutes to midnight. We're very close to that end point. And we haven't got an agreement with the EU. So it looks like a hard Brexit. But there is another detail which is very relevant in Isaiah chapter 23. 
um, skipped over it a little bit as I read it. Uh, in verse 15, and it shall come to pass in that day that Tyre shall be forgotten seventy years according to the days of one king. After the end of seventy years shall Tyre sing as an harlot. Now, we might think as the years of one king and gloss over it. But it is a most unusual thing for there to be one king for seventy years. Wikipedia could only throw up three people who in the past have reigned 70 plus years. Louis XIV of France, Rama IX of Thailand, and Johann II of Liechtenstein. So only three rulers have ruled for 70 plus years. Now we know that the Queen has been on the throne for 67 years. She ascended to the throne on February 1952, so just 67 years and a few weeks ago, she became queen. So does this point to the fact that we've got to wait another three years for the 70 years to reach their climax and for Britain then to be free to do the role that God has portrayed in Isaiah chapter 23? And maybe. In actual fact, the Queen undertook her royal duties before the death of her father in the previous year because her father was so ill. So we could say if there was a two-year transition period, then that would then be 70 years. I don't know. I think Britain's going to break hard Brexit in the end of this coming month. And it could well be another couple of years before all the pieces are put together for her then to be free to do what she wants. Because she hasn't, she's wasted two years, which could have been spent making all the preparations. But because Mrs May, her heart was in still being attached to Europe, things didn't happen. In fact, if you want to look at it, the, the Queen, when she was 21, undertook her first royal duty um, and that was when she declared that she would uh, pledge, I would declare before you all the my, sorry, I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service. And that's just over 70 years ago, that was last month, last year. But the Queen has been a remarkable woman and has bound together the Commonwealth, which has been such an important role, will play an important role in Britain's uh, freedom as she plays the harlot with all nations of the world. But we're in interesting times. 70 years is about to end. And if God willing, the Queen is still alive, even if it is another two or three years, then we shall see the fulfilment of this prophecy. So we have at the helm an uncertain helmsman. She says, full speed ahead, and others say, no, we've got to turn back to Brussels. Now, I'm not going to go through all the boring details of what has happened, but we're re arriving at the seeming impasse, um, because Mrs Mays accepted a deal which is not acceptable to the MPs of this country. And what is interesting is what is the sticking point? And it is the Northern Ireland border. It all comes down to religion. Now, at the moment, with Britain and Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic all being in the EU, that's fine. Trade goes across that long border uh, with no barriers at all. But it's when Britain says we're leaving and taking Northern Ireland with us that the problems start because that border then becomes one where Northern Ireland is outside the EU. And that has to then be a border between an EU, EU member and what they call a third country, one that is not a member. And this is the sticking point, this border across Northern Ireland. It's being used as a tool to trap Britain. It's a long border, 310 miles long, many roads cross it, 
and it divides the northern Ireland, which was very strongly Protestant, from the south, which was very strongly Catholic. As that chart tells you, the democratic uh, balance is changing. The Roman Catholic uh, growth is in Northern Ireland, and the Protestant is shrinking, so there's a very small margin between the two. And what the EU saw was this is a wonderful way of reuniting Ireland by trapping Northern Ireland into a special position. This is what the backstop is all about, that the Northern Ireland will be in a special position to be more or less still remain in the EU, whereas the rest of Britain will be outside the EU. And the Daily Telegraph had it spot on. It comes down to whether you think the Commission is genuinely acting in the interests of Irish peace or exploiting an emotional issue in order to lock the EU into its customs territory and legal orbit. And this is what the EU very cleverly did. They stitched up Mrs May, she didn't realise it. But by this backstop arrangement, whereby Britain is um, locked into uh, the embrace of the EU until the problem can be solved, and it is only solved if the EU is satisfied with the solution, and so many countries in the EU want their own way, France on fishing, uh, Spain on Gibraltar, and all these different countries, the possibility of, of the EU countries agreeing to some solution is very small. And Britain does face, unless she says, no, we're going to go, even without an agreement, she remains locked in. So what they want to do, as I say, is to keep the Northern Ireland within the orbit of the EU, keeping all the rules and regulations, whereas Britain is a third country outside the EU, uh, and the border then becomes between uh, Britain and the whole of Ireland. Uh, and very skillfully, Northern Ireland is reabsorbed back into the Irish Republic. So that's what the EU wants. Now, as I say, it is uh, a problem because of the busyness of this border, with its many roads, over two million vehicle crossings a month. Every day, 30,000 people go one way or the other. And the trade between the two is not inconsiderable. The annual trade from the north to the south is 1.6 billion pounds, and from the south to the north, 1.4 billion pounds. I say up to now, it doesn't matter. Milk can travel from north to south, be turned into butter and taken back across the border. But once there is a border there and tariffs, then that makes life very complicated and upsets the Irish who feel that they are being sucked back, the Northern Irish especially, being sucked back into Southern Ireland. And so this was the stick that has been held over Britain. This is uh, Dominic Rapp, who was uh, one of those who was the minister for bringing about these negotiations, who resigned over the agreement that Mrs May brought back. You would hear swirling around in Brussels, particularly the people around Martin Selma in the Commission and some others, that losing Northern Ireland was the price the UK would pay for Brexit. This was reported to me through the diplomatic channel. He says it's one thing to defend your interests robustly, but there's another thing in the spirit of so-called European unity to be trying to carve up a major European nation, Britain. That's what they clearly were wanting to do. Carve Britain up, take Northern Ireland out of Britain's control, reunite it into Catholic South. And so, John Claude Juncker really said the truth. When he said, when it comes to Brexit, it's like being before the courts or on the high seas. We're in God's hands, and we can never be sure, quite sure, when God will take the matter in hand. But he is going to take the matter in hand, and not in the way that the EU wants. The EU thought that they got Britain trapped and got her where she wanted it. But the British spirit is rebelling against that. 
They don't, they've seen even more why the EU is unattractive to the British spirit. They want to be free to go their own way. And God will make sure that through the circumstances which will come, in ways which probably we haven't anticipated, that that division will come. Britain will leave and go her own way. And so what on Britain's future? Well, this was a cartoon from the uh, Guardian, which was saying, well, the Commonwealth is the natural place to turn to. These are people who want to do business with us. And the angels will somehow make it possible that Britain, having left, Project Fear will not become a reality, that Britain will, after a period of adjustment, no doubt, um, be prosperous and will go around the world, as Isaiah said. She wants to play the harlot to all nations of the world. Couldn't be clearer. That's what she wants to do. And uh, as Britain gets closer and closer to that cliff edge, so there are many in Europe who are very worried that it's going to be Europe that suffers, not Britain, when Britain leaves the EU. So much of the European trade is from Europe to Britain rather than from Britain to Europe. And if suddenly there are barriers and there are tariffs, then Germany especially could be a, a very hardy hit. And um, there's great pressures growing within Europe to be more reasonable um, to, uh, to Britain's needs and to bring about uh, some deal, even if it's only just ensuring, which they have already done, that the planes will fly, fly and the uh, trains can go from one country to another. But we're in a fascinating time. And the closer we get, the more exciting it's going to be. So, what does um, the future hold? Well, we have to turn to Scripture. Scripture makes it quite clear, Isaiah 23 is one of them, that she's going to commit fornication with all the kingdoms of the world on the face of the earth. So she's going to be a, a trading power again, as she was in the past. Ezekiel 38 makes it clear that as the merchants of Tarshish, with her young lions, She's going to be opposed to Europe and Russia invading Israel. And Isaiah again and Psalm 45 and other passages tell us that Britain is going to recognise when the Lord Jesus, having overthrown the Gogian army, establishes that kingdom. Britain will recognise that this is the king of Israel. We have to do as he wants and submit and if the Queen is still alive on the throne, then she will willingly hand over her crown to him. And so this is why it's so interesting that in the talks and the aims that Britain has and the outlines that she is making, it is making agreements with the Commonwealth countries and with Israel. And she's putting her... Uh, planning to put her armed forces back into the Middle East, among the Arab nations. It's just so fascinating to see it. And I don't know whether you listened to the Queen's speech, but she was very supportive of the Commonwealth. She said, my father welcomed just eight countries to the first such meeting in 1948. But in April last year, when the Commonwealth heads met in London, there were 53 countries with 2.4 billion people, a third of the world's population. Its strength lies in the bonds of affection it promotes and a common desire to live a better, more peaceful world. Even with the most deeply held differences, treating the other person with respect and as a fellow human being is always a good first step towards greater understanding. Now this Queen is a very wise woman and she was putting a little message, subtle message underneath those lines. Why have all the rejection and the hassle with the EU when there are countries out there who are dying to do business with you? Get on with it, that's what she was saying. 
And so Liam Fox, who's the Secretary of State for International Trade, uh, just uh, this past Sunday, this article, the time, there is a time beyond Brexit and a world beyond Europe. Being able to negotiate individual deals with non-EU countries will allow the UK to build up, build on an already strong fundamentally picture to take a global leadership role on trade, which will spread prosperity and ultimately aid collective security, he says. We'll take up our independent seat on the World Trade Organization um, at a time when the world has never needed clearer leadership on global trading issues. He sees a worldwide global picture for Britain beckoning. And uh, again, this week, Donald Trump says uh, it gave Britain a massive boost, declaring that trade between the UK and the US will be very substantially increased after Brexit. A special relationship will be strengthened further following a new mutual trade agreement arrangement agreed between both countries worth at least 12.8 billion a year for transatlantic trade. He also significantly raised the hopes of a wide ranging trade deal between UK and US by insisting he wanted to see the transatlantic business significantly increased. UK and US officials signed a mutual recognition agreement earlier this week to ensure that when Britain leaves, then trade can carry on as they make uh, an even deeper trade agreement between them. And Britain has already made agreements with the United States, with Australia, with New Zealand, with Chile, with East and South African countries, with Switzerland, with the little Faroe Islands, with Liechtenstein, and just this week with Israel. Liam Fox was on Monday in Israel signing a continuity deal so that as soon as Britain leaves, she can continue to trade with Israel as she has in the past, again as a foundation step through hammering out a more detailed uh, and more uh, advantageous trade agreement. But this is ensuring that there will be no disadvantages for Britain when she leaves. I thought it was quite fascinating that this was signed. Look at the background. It's pictures of the Holocaust. Who led that Holocaust? Germany. Who is leading the EU along its road to political union? Germany. I thought it was quite significant that uh, this signing ceremony was in front of this Holocaust pictures. And Britain is very much drawn to Israel. Uh, there's a historic partnership, a historic friendship between the United Kingdom and Israel. A deep, strong, deep-rooted friendship. And uh, this is uh, Jeremy Hunt, the Foreign Secretary. Uh, this was uh, just a few weeks ago. I, I want to say something that is about Brexit and is about the very, very important role that both Israel and Britain need to play in a post-Brexit world and that is simply this, the democracy of which Israel is a shining beacon and which Britain has always stood for, these democratic values cannot be taken for granted in the modern world. So we're saying Britain, Israel, we've got to roll together to support democracy against the autocracy which is shaping in China, in Europe, in Russia. And the BICOM, the Britain-Israel Communications Research Centre, back in December produced a fascinating 14-page report on Britain and Israel after Brexit. Fascinating reading. But uh, what it's saying is the bonds between the two countries are very close. Here is a market which can grow as soon as Britain is no longer tied by the shackles that uh, the EU imposes upon the kind of deals that she can make, then the future is very bright for Britain and Israel. Uh, and Israel is investing very heavily in the United Kingdom, in advanced technology, uh, helping the NHS modernize, and using the UK as a springboard to the world markets. <laughs> So just a brief diversion, because we've talked about Israel. Israel and the Middle East and Arab nations. This is a remarkable sign of our times, 
something which seemed impossible to happen, and yet we've seen it happening uh, before our eyes. Uh, and again, the basis is, we know that Sheba and Dedan, the Arab nations, southern Arab nations, are siding with Israel when Gog invades. So this is a complete turnaround from the past. We know that Abraham's children, and these are Arab nations descendant from Abraham, they're going to be blessed in the kingdom. Wonderful psalm, psalm, psalm. Uh, Isaiah chapter 60, wonderful chapter there, which talks about Midian and Ephra and Sheba and Kedon and Baal. Uh, these are all children or grandchildren of Abraham. Their offerings will come up upon mine altar, be acceptable. And it speaks of Israel and the, and the Arab nations worshipping together at the temple in Jerusalem. And Isaiah 56 also, similarly. And we know from Isaiah that in that day, the day of the kingdom, that uh, Israel will be the third with Egypt uh, and Assyria, even a blessing in the midst of the land. Whom Yahweh of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, mine inheritance. So we know ultimately that it's going to be this healing of the divisions which take place at the moment. And so we have Israel making friendships in preparation for that day of when Abraham will be raised from the dead and will be able to bring his children together. Now just last week was a remarkable two-day conference in Warsaw in Poland. It was sponsored by the Americans and the Poles. It brought together the representatives of 60 different nations including 10 Arab leaders or oh, foreign ministers. They all met together with Israel. And they shared a meal together. And they discussed the problems that they were facing. And so around this table, this dinner table, was Israel and America, the uh, heads of Bahrain and Kuwait and the United Arab Emirates and representatives from Saudi Arabia and Oman, Egypt, Jordan, Yemen, Tunisia and off the map Morocco. An absolutely amazing thing, brothers and sisters. And yet it probably only got a little tiny mention in the papers. But as uh, Mike Pence, who is the Vice President of the USA, who was there representing Donald Trump. He said, tonight I believe we're beginning a new era with Prime Minister Netanyahu from the State of Israel, with leaders from Bahrain, Saudi Arabia and the UAE, all breaking bread together, and later in this conference sharing honest perspectives on the challenges facing the area, he said. And some of the headlines were a regional realignment and history is changing course. But that's what God said, didn't he? Through Ezekiel, two and a half thousand years ago. And we're privileged, brothers and sisters and young people and friends, to see this taking place before our eyes. The realignment of the nations. Europe and Russia coming together to form the legs in opposition to Israel. Israel and Britain and the Arab nations coming together. A wonderful real alignment. So back to Britain and the Middle East. A month earlier in November, uh, BICOM had published again a fascinating, well worth downloading um, booklet on uh, what they saw as Britain's Middle East strategy after Brexit. The Middle East is important as an export and investment destination for goods and services and a source of vital inward investment in the UK. The UK exports more goods and services to the Arab world than to China or to Brazil and India combined. The UK also sources significant sums of inward investment from the Gulf Arab states and is keen to remain the leading European power in the region. Europe's not interested. Even America is beginning to fade. 
And just as America stepped in when Britain faded out in the 50s, so as America is beginning to fade out of it, Britain is stepping back into that region in order that the scriptures might be fulfilled. But it's not the will of man, but it's the will of God that is taking place. It went on to say that the uh, UK is Qatar's largest investment destination with 35 billion of investments in the UK. The economic significance of the ties with the oil-rich Gulf states are increasing due to Brexit, as the UK seeks to expand trade and inward investment beyond the EU and maintain the City of London as the world's premier global financial centre. Saudi Arabia other Arab states seek to diversify their economies, well, Andrew was talking about that, they are so dependent on oil, creating new opportunities for UK businesses. I thought this was an interesting report from the Spectator at the end of the year. Today's Arab tribes see Britain differently to any other nation. We have characteristics that make us deeply distinctive. Too often we forget that Britain's monarchy is a source of pride for the Gulf and other Arab monarchs. Prince Charles' warm relationship with Gulf monarchs give Great Britain privileged status that no American, German or French president can rival. It is because of Britain's special place and attraction that Sandhurst and our private schools have had more future Arab leaders in training for a century than any other institution. And MBS, that's the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, has been brave in recognising Jewish claims to land in the Israel. We in the West should help him make peace between the children of Abraham a reality. Well, that was fascinating, because we know that's exactly what's got to happen. Now, Britain has her bases in the Middle East. She has them in Bahrain, Qatar, uh, Oman, as well as in Cyprus, and in uh, Kenya, and in that little tiny island in the middle of the Indian Ocean, uh, Diego Garcia. She has, in fact, uh, 16 overseas bases, of which two, four, five, six are in the Middle East, so quite a proportion are there, over a third in this region. Just look at a few brief details. So Bahrain is a very important centre because it's very close to Iran, and from here Britain can ensure that the oil will flow, that uh, Iran won't be able to stop it. And earlier last year, in April, this new base, which has been sponsored by the um, uh, Bahrainian government, a uh, 40 million pound base, uh, it allows the Navy to maintain a permanent presence in the region without having to return warships to Britain every six months. So here is a permanent foothold that Britain has, right in the heart between Iran and Saudi Arabia and the other nations. Just to the south is again a little country, Qatar, but very rich. And this is where Britain has her Air Force base. In fact, they just celebrated the 100th anniversary, because Britain was very early on, wasn't she, in uh, aircraft in World War I. So this base established 100 years ago, uh, and it is their largest base in the Middle East. Uh, just further south in Oman, Amman has links with Britain which go back for centuries. And last August, Michael Fallon, who was the Defence Minister, he signed a cooperation uh, agreement which allowed the UK to maintain the facilities at the port at the base where the uh, end of the stick is um, uh, there. And it's going to be a joint base uh, training base for the UK and the Omani army, and it's going to open next month. Interestingly, the port facilities are being enlarged so that the UK's new aircraft carriers can be based there. There are not a lot of ports which can take them. HMS uh, Queen Elizabeth is a huge ship, uh, there she is in Portsmouth. And she is destined, uh, if the uh, Gavin Willison has his way, 
He wants to cement Britain's role in the Middle East with this space in Oman. The UK is cementing its deep and special relationship with Oman for generations to come with the opening of a new base, and so that opens next month. Um, so he signed uh, this agreement with them, and it underlines the UK's enduring commitment to Oman and highlights the importance of protecting peace and stability in the Gulf. And what is said, I can announce, this was a talk he gave earlier this month to the Royal United Services Institute, I can announce the first operational mission of HMS Queen Elizabeth will include the Mediterranean, the Middle East and the Pacific regions, making global Britain a reality. Um, the base is being enlarged so that that Queen Elizabeth aircraft carrier can be based there. And it's enhancing the reach and lethality of our forces and reinforcing the fact the United States remains our very closest of partners. We're more determined than ever to keep working together. And so at this uh, port, Port Dum, uh, that's where uh, Britain is making this big base and it is from there that she seeks to project her power over the whole of the Middle East region. She also works very closely with Saudi Arabia, does a lot of training, has a lot of personnel, a lot of British people uh, live in Saudi Arabia and work in the armaments industry there. And in spite of the events of the murder of Khashoggi, um, the relationships between Britain and Saudi Arabia run very deep. And the trade which Britain does with Saudi and Saudi does with Britain, the bilateral trade runs to £9 billion a year and it's poised to expand very greatly. So what about the young lions? We've looked at Britain, we've looked at Israel. What about the young lions? How are the young lions involved in the Middle East? Well, the chiefest of the young lions, of course, is the United States. She's got bases in uh, Syria. Um, in Jordan, in Iraq, in Kuwait, in Bahrain, in Qatar, United Arab Emirates, in Oman, in Djibouti, in Afghanistan, in Diego Garcia, that little island, in Crete. She works with Saudi, she works with Egypt, and she works with Israel. So she very much is enhanced, uh, ensconced in the Middle East. And although America first, uh, Trump still believes that she has to have a presence here. And for Israel, the friendship between America and Israel has been very strong. And last year was a very significant year as the United States moved its embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem and Donald Trump's daughter opened it. And in the United Nations, the astounding work that Nikki Haley undertook while she was the US ambassador there, to counter the frog-like spirits which were pouring out from the United Nations and standing up for Israel's right. Uh, a wonderful work that she has done. And it has helped the situation tremendously. From Israel's point of view, it has helped to enforce the hostility of the other nations against Israel, all part of the frog-like spirits. Now another of the Young Lions is India, uh, and India has uh, a very strong linkage to Israel, a lot of trade between the two, but she also has strong linkage with the Middle East, and only this week the uh, Crown Prince has, of Saudi Arabia has been in India, and on Wednesday, was it, 21st, uh, Crown Prince um, Salman received a King's Welcome in India, where his government intends to invest 100 billion dollars over the next two years. So we can see India being drawn not only to Israel but to the southern uh, states. Absolutely fascinating. Australia too, very strong links to Israel. She too has strong links to the Middle East. Her exports of sheep and wheat and that go to this region, very important for her for Australia. One of the young lions operating in this area will be opposed to any invasion uh, from the north. 
We go to the other side of the world to Canada, and Canada too, great friendship with Israel. And again, a uh, great uh, trader with the Middle East. And so, brothers and sisters, and young people and friends, I'm coming to my last slide, we have seen remarkable changes just in the past five years, undreamt of. Yes, they were dreamt of. Our brothers and sisters, my father writing in earlier milestones, Brother Thomas, Brother Roberts, saw these things because they read the scriptures. They let scripture guide them. We have to let scripture guide us. And this is our test of faith. It has taken 170 years to get to this point from Brother Thomas's day and Brother Robert's day. But it is coming to pass. We have to be patient. But how thankful we are, the long-suffering of God has enabled so many brothers and sisters to come to the truth, to be enlightened with these wonderful things, to see for their very selves the things that are happening in the Middle East according to Scripture, and convincing them of the truth of the Word of God. Many sitting in the audience here have been convinced of the truth through the word of prophecy. So my closing but one slide is going back to that quotation of Brother Roberts back in 1874. Wisdom stands on a very high place, but her voice is unheard in the din. So she is about to come down from her pedestal and flash her lightning sword in the eyes of the infatuated crowds and scatter death in their ranks, that the rest may attend and do her bidding. There will be no good time on earth till this occur. The watchers watch for it and wait. The tokens multiply. And as our two former speakers have painted the picture, God's judgment will come. Because the world has seen the evidence, has seen the evidence that we have seen, that the word of God is true, and yet it has turned its back on God. It says there is no God. We're free to do what we want. We don't think these people are God's people. They've got no rights to this land. And they will experience the judgments of God. And the scriptures tell us how painful it will be. But the end effect will be that the nations will know that Yahweh, he is God. And brothers and sisters and young people, may we be ready and waiting for our master when he comes. Before long, before all this, the judgment gets poured out, the master comes back to gather his household, to judge them, and to prepare them for that great work of saving his people from the hand of their enemies and bringing about peace and righteousness <coughs> and truth upon the earth. And so my usual last one, uh, Milestones gives a yearly update, the Bible magazine gives a quarterly update, and the snippets give every two or three days. There's so much stuff coming out. But if you want to be kept up to date with the interesting things that are happening, just send me an email and I'll put you on the list.